Thank you for auditing the always positive new music review show hosted by a French professor who is not ready to talk about Donda yet. I'll get to it later in the week, but I've been listening to the new album by Big Red Machine. How long do you think it's going to last? And I have some thoughts about it. I really enjoyed it, but at some point, I'm going to tell you the stupidest reason I almost didn't review this album. If you are familiar with, with history and you look around me, you might be able to determine why. Now, one reason why I wasn't going to review it is supergroups, as a rule, totally suck. Anytime, almost any time, giants from any musical field get together to form a group, it ends up being bad. Think about The Firm, you know, with Jimmy Page and Paul Rogers from the 80s. Jimmy Page is great, Paul Rogers is great, The Firm was not. Think about The Firm with Foxy Brown, Dr. Dre, and Nas in hip hop a decade later. The individuals are great, the collaborative was not. And of course, let's not forget the best example of why supergroups should never be formed, the Traveling Wilburys, whose music was, I contend, the worst music of the 1980s. Someday I'm gonna make a video about that for my Patreons. I don't like to be negative here, but holy cow, do I hate the Traveling Wilburys. Other examples abound, you know, like, like quicker supergroups that are formed, you know, like, like We Are The World. Like anytime anybody says they have to check their ego at the door, it's usually not very good. You, may, you should keep the ego in the door. That's what got you to be so famous and so driven in the first place, you know? So, you know, We Are The World's not very good. The, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame super jams aren't very good. Dancing in the Streets with David Bowie and, and uh, Mick Jagger isn't very good. In general, though, these super groups, you know, and the best of, you know, there are some good ones, obviously. Any good music that Eric Clapton managed to make in his weird, long, and increasingly pathetic life um, has been the result of a supergroup, you know, like Cream or Derek and the Dominoes. But in general, the issue with supergroups is it just, it just lacks singular vision, you know? And with this group, we have one of the main people behind The National, Aaron Dessner, who importantly also produced the last two Taylor Swift albums, Folkmore and Evermore, Folklore and Evermore, <laughs> some combination of those syllables. And of course, Justin Vernon, who is Bon Iver slash is part of Bon Iver, right? So we have these two bands that are great, absolute monsters of 21st century indie folk and indie rock. And the thing with, with supergroups is too often it just feels like people having fun together, you know? Like, isn't this fun? Can you believe we're doing this? Uh-oh, is this a crossover episode? To quote Mr. Peanut Butter, that's the feeling that I often get from these. Fortunately, I didn't get that at all from Big Red Machine. And I think that's because why this is an exception is because Bon Iver and Aaron Dessner have been honing their craft as collaborators, people who work with other people, people who have on many occasions sacrificed their singular vision to another artist's in order to create a great piece of art. Previously mentioned, Aaron Dessner obviously has had to do that to make the great ever long, more folk, folk more, whatever it is, the last two Taylor Swift albums, he has had to take whatever it is that makes him part of the national and be a part of something else. Bon Iver, in addition to working with Taylor Swift himself, has also shown, in particular his, his work with Kanye West, the ability to subjugate his, his amazing vision, his amazing songwriting, uh, song craft, his voice, everything, to give it to another artist. It's actually funny having this combination between people who've, who've collaborated with Taylor and people who've collaborated with Kanye. I've been talking about this for years now. I'm proud to announce, uh, I am just a professor of French, but I have some deep industry contacts. And there has, in fact, been a supergroup formed. They're called The Innocent and the Famous. And it's Kanye, Taylor Swift, and Bon Iver, Justin Irvin. Uh, uh, I mean, Justin Vernon. They're coming up with an album. It's tentatively titled I'ma Let You Finish, and it's going to be coming out sometime in 2023. I'm excited for it. I didn't just make that up. That's a real thing. I did just make that up, but still, I think it could possibly happen. I think that that spirit of collaboration, uh, Justin Vernon could make it happen because he has that ability to work with other people and to make something good. So this album by Big Red Machine manages to be so good because we have these two people who know how to collaborate and we have people who produce. 
And I mean that like in the musical sense of producers, you know, people who really think, how do I produce an album? They're not focused on performance. It's not, okay, I'm gonna perform my bit. Okay, I'm gonna perform my bit. I'm gonna do a guitar solo. I'm gonna do a guitar, uh, keyboard solo. Let's go. It really is like two people trying to produce something. Now, it's interesting is that what they produced in some ways, and this is gonna sound insulting, but what the hell, uh, in some ways is, is boring. Uh, they're all just songs. There's not really a unified theme. There might be some COVID stuff going on here, or themes of family, you know, there are some themes throughout the album, but in general, it is just a bunch of music, very well crafted in the same basic register. It is a satisfying and at times transcendently wonderful exercise in expected synthesis. Like if you told me these two people are gonna make music together, I would think in my head what it would sound like and what it would sound like is what this sounds like. Now the good news is that what I imagined it sound like was very good and very satisfying. I'm calling out around the world. I've had, I've had bad poster luck lately. Um, and how do we define this sound? This kind of boring, kind of samey, I mean, it's not boring. Just this very consistent sound throughout the entire album. I, I have an idea. And, and I'm wearing my idea. And, and I brought along another idea. A, another example, okay? This is the sweater that my wife got me uh, for Christmas a couple years ago. It's an exact replica of Chris Evans' sweater in Knives Out. Aspirational sweater buying. What is a sweater? And why do I think Bon Iver and Aaron Dessner got together and made the essential sweater music album? How can we define what do I mean by sweater music? First of all, let's talk about a sweater like these wonderful handcrafted in Ireland sweaters. They're warm, like Big Red Machine. They're comfortable, like Big Red Machine. They're well-constructed, like Big Red Machine. They evoke a time when people spent more time crafting things instead of just producing them as quickly as they can for maximum profit, like Big Red Machine. In another way though, a nice sweater like this, it's a symbol of privilege. This is, this is expensive. This was, this was my Christmas gift. This wasn't a Christmas gift. These sweaters were it that year. Something has happened, and what's fascinating is it wasn't always like this. I was talking to my, my, my wife, the doctor and missus, about this theory, and she grew up in Serbia, you know, during the sanctions and during a time of pretty hard economic times. And for her, a sweater is not a symbol of privilege at all. It was the, the clothes that they could afford because the grandmother could knit it, and it was basically free. You know, like, like what, is, what happened to sweaters? Because think about it, a nice sweater, you see Taylor Swift wearing it on the cover of her albums. I first got introduced to Bon Iver by the video to their song Holocene, with a little kid walking around in a sweater. There's something warm and hugely and comforting about this music that is also, to a certain extent, a representation of a certain kind of privilege. An outdoorsy, in touch with nature, predominantly white, predominantly upper middle class to rich, this feeling of having a sweater. And it's tied in to the greatest drug uh, that all <laughs> upper middle class white people search at all times, the drug they fiend for most often is authenticity. Having so much, being given so much, you don't know what to do with it that you end up chasing after things that feel more real because whatever's been given to you, whatever is just there, just seems too easy, just seems too natural. A polyester sweatshirt will keep you just as warm, but it, it doesn't feel real, organic, connected to nature. I think this music, and it is great, this is a great album, is a lot like this sweater, which is great, it is a great sweater in that way. Very high quality, very awesome, but to a certain extent, this wave of folk music, 
with its insistence on acoustic instrumentation, but mixing in with modern uh, technology as well. It feels partly like this eternally um, white privileged search for some sort of authenticity. <sighs> So, now that I've pissed off a fair number of you, feel free to leave comments and likes and uh, subscribe to me. I'm so close to 20,000. If I could get to 20,000 subscribers before the three-year anniversary of this show, I would be so psyched. It used to be my goal to get one subscriber a day. I've now passed that, uh, passed that mark. So please do subscribe and comment and tell me how I don't know what the hell I'm talking about. Uh, I love that stuff. So now that we're here, let's, let's, talk, let's get into some of these sweaters, okay? Let's get into some of these. First of all, it's kind of hot in here. It is raining outside. You might hear Toby barking. He's upstairs. The doctor and missus is being his thunder buddy. I am usually his thunder buddy. I am a hell of a thunder buddy. Let's go to the stamp. So if you don't know, I begin every review with a sample song. I call it my homework. If you don't know what the sound of the album sounds like, this will get you into it. I'm gonna put it up there. I had to go with Renegade, the song that features most prominently Taylor Swift. It's the best song on the album. It is the most important song on the album. It is the song on the album that this album will ultimately be remembered for because Taylor Swift is such a giant and has deservedly earned this reputation as one of the most important artists alive. Taylor Swift's movement towards sweater music has been very pronounced, right? Since, since Lover, her last couple albums have been there, but she does a version of it that I like even more, which is I would call the pop sweater, okay? It's not trying to be super um, hard to listen to. It's not trying to be like particularly challenging. It's just a straight up Taylor Swift song, but produced with this kind of stitching. You know what I mean? And her voice is just so clear. On this album, the vocal work is amazing, but her voice is just so clear, it rides over everything. You know, the, drum, the, the drummer seems to be having like fun in the back. Like at times, like the production's great all the way throughout this album. This, I mean, um, we are living in, it seems like producers have figured out computers. I don't know what, but it, it feels like every week I come up with a new album and I'm like, oh my God, the production on this is amazing. I haven't heard production this good since blah, 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 you know? Uh, it's astounding how good the production is. And an example on this song is where like the drums just sort of pop in and then jump out. And like a guitar like, gets started and goes out and there's like a little solo and all these little things happening. And this sweater is way too hot. I, do, I, I cannot be this hugely on a video. It's not worth it for the metaphor. Uh, and the lyrics are just the best. Um, Taylor Swift is awesome. And I talk about that a lot, but, but her... She is under, somebody so well esteemed is always going to be underrated, you know what I mean? To a certain extent. Every line of the chorus is devastating. Every line, the first time I heard it, I went, oh, oh, hey, oh, come on. Are you really going to talk about timing in times like these? Where's, where's my coffee? Usually if I, have a, if, I, if I read off a really good lyric, I have a sip of coffee. Well, I need a Joe Cool for that one. Are you really going to talk about timing in times like these? Mmm, Snoopy. And let all your damage damage me, and carry your baggage up my street, and make your future, and make me your future history. Just great. Simple turns of phrase. Slightly expected words, turned around, don't let your damage damage me. And then this builds in the verses where she has all these lyrics about this person that she's with who just can't get his stuff together and about she is someone who has. Is it insensitive for me to say, quote, get your ish together so I can love you? Is it really your anxiety that stops you from giving me everything or do you just not want to? Snoopy, Snoopy. Taylor Swift is writing amazing lyrics right now. Is it really your anxiety that stops me from, from you from giving me everything or do you just not want to? The real question that comes up all the time, when you are in a relationship with somebody who is suffering from, from significant, not necessarily major, but significant mental health problems, this is always the question. Is it that they have problems or are they just a jerk? And how do you separate those things? Like, am I going crazy or is this person crazy or is this person just a selfish jerk? I cannot tell you the amount of times in my life I want to say, or do you just not want to? And that's not always gonna start with the same sentence. Is it really my anxiety that stops me from giving you everything? I mean, give you, giving me everything. But hell, even with my students, you know? 
Is it really your anxiety that stops you from studying and trying to achieve in this test? Or do you just really not want to, you know? My, my, my daughter, is it really that you fell asleep after a, a long camping trip and you took a nap and that's why you didn't walk the dogs and that's why Toby took a dump in, the, in his living room? Or did you really not want to? You know, like these kinds of excuses that pop up, how do we process them, you know? And how do we work with that? Uh, I, I, was, I was listening to this while preparing for my classes. Classes start tomorrow. And, uh, and the doctor and missus overheard this. And this was her quote. I love all these therapy songs. Does everybody go to therapy these days? And I think it's true. I think that uh, we are seeing a lot of great artists moving past being tortured and using being tortured as fodder for their art. Instead, we're having people get cured of their torture and using that to fuel their art. While she said that, she was making gazpacho soup. That's pretty exciting. I'm gonna have that for dinner. I'll give a review of the gazpacho soup. If anybody wants to know how my gazpacho soup tasted, let me know in the comments. I'm gonna go through the rest of the album much quicker. It's a long album. My biggest problem with the album is it's long. It's just a long album. It's like an hour and something or other. It's a lot of this mood. It is a lot of sweater going on here. It opens up with the track Later Days by Anais Mitchell, uh, you know, with Anais Mitchell. Kind of a cool, like, Paul McCartney sounding drum beat here. Reminded me of Paul McCartney, the way he plays on his, when he plays drums by himself. And the whistling, it kind of reminds you of the, the way that often Paul McCartney is cited as the father of this kind of music. And I think his search for authenticity and his love of sweaters, what with all those wools and stuff in Scotland, I do think that we could see Paul McCartney as potentially the grandfather of this indie folk sweater music. Um, and then just, you know, when Bon Iver comes in, it's just awesome. Just hearing Justin Viner, you know, when he comes in, it's just great. I, I, the, it seems like his voice goes really well with everybody's voice. It seems like whatever it is, whatever song there is, you can just throw in and it's always going to sound good. Now, my wife says that's not a good Bon Iver impersonation. I think it's good. Uh, Reese is the next song. Cool kind of piano, kind of chugging along drums. Here we have the other register of Justin Vernon, the way he sings, where he's got that other, like, more sincere, less falsetto voice. I can't even come close to imitating that. Just this great, like, sweet and rich guitar solo, like, guitar sounds and the woman's voice in the background. Even a little bit of, like, a poppy doo-doo-doo at points. Phoenix has Fleet Foxes in it. At this point, I mean, I... I've got so much sweater going on. I can't, I can't even see. I can't even talk to you anymore because we have so much sweater happening in this song. It's insane. You know, I mean, some of the best music of this sort, I'd say, is made by the Fleet Foxes. You know, I, I prefer Fleet Foxes to both The National and, uh, and Bon Iver. But just his voice works so well. And then again, having his voice with Justin Vernon's voice it's something I didn't think I wanted to hear, but I really do. Great usage of horns, very sparse usage of horns. Again, just the production on here is just, is just great. Um, they sort of get this little jam going at the end where Justin Vernon's repeating the chorus kind of over and over again, uh, saying, making my heart change shape. That's a great verse as well. Um, the next track is called Birch, which features Taylor Swift, but it's cool because it starts off with this like Kid A style drum beat and then like an amnesiac style piano line, you know, by Radiohead. And then eventually like some strings soften it. But we have this kind of almost polyrhythm thing going on and Justin Vernon starts singing and Taylor Swift ends up being a spice and not, not a main ingredient of the dish. I, I don't know of other songs where, where Taylor Swift is used like this, but it's great because she adds a lot to it without taking over the song, which is why it's so nice. And the song gets a lot more interesting as it goes on. Again, great usage of strings. Again, nice sparing usage of horns coming in and out for uh, emotional effectiveness. Having, Bir having Birch with Taylor Swift as a little guest and then having her lead Renegade one after the other, it's just a great one-two punch. The next song is called Ghost of Cincinnati. I guess this is Aaron Destner getting personal because he's from Cincinnati. Um, I'm now gonna tell you the stupid reason I almost didn't review this, uh, this album. I hate, I hate the Big Red Machine. Now, if you're not familiar with the history of American baseball, then you're not gonna understand what I mean by I hate 
the Big Red Machine. You see, I was born in 1977, but my brothers are somewhat older. And so when I grew up, I grew up loving a baseball team I never knew. The 1975 Boston Red Sox, who wore a hat like that. That's the team that had Carlton Fisk waving the ball fair. That's the team, Cecil Cooper and Jim Rice, and Fred Lynn, Yastrzemski. They're the greatest team. See, I grew up before the Red Sox won a World Series. So this was like our, our greatest and our coolest team. And when I was a kid, I didn't hate the New York Yankees. I hated the Cincinnati Reds <laughs> because whatever, 12 years before, you know, 12 years before then, they beat the Red Sox in the World Series. So that is the hilariously bad reason why I almost didn't review this. But I love hearing this because in that time, you know, since then, I obviously don't care anymore. I mean, I love, I still have baseball, but I don't care. I don't even hate the Yankees. Um, but it's, it's fascinating to have a song about Cincinnati. And I'm very happy that it's here because I often think like, why, why does every song have to be about New York? And then like, one in every 10, one in every 50 songs about New York, there's one song about Los Angeles. Like, haven't they gotten enough? Like, why, why aren't artists just, really is a crappy song. Why aren't artists like seizing on this opportunity and like making the Wichita song or making the Tulsa song or making the Carson City song, you know? I mean, if, if, as an example, if Taylor Swift wrote a song called Welcome to Carson City, that song would be played everywhere in Carson City. And whenever you said you were from Carson City, people would go, oh, like the Taylor Swift song? So I'm happy that there's some other geographical representation. Also, as a Star Wars collector, Kenner Toys was in Cincinnati, so I've actually gone to Cincinnati a fair amount as a tourist looking at where toys used to be made. Musically, I like, I like this because Destner actually sings. Very kind of Elliot Smith style, but still it's good. It's very personal. This is the least produced of all the songs. It's just him and a guitar, and it works quite nicely. Uh, Hoping Then is a great, mostly Bon Iver-led song here. It's kind of jumpy and jittery guitars. Some like staccato strings, I think, like plucking. This is the most kind of avant-garde song. I have not listened to their previous album. Apparently it's more avant-garde, maybe it's more like this. And this has the best way of using Justin Vernon's voice in between his sort of two modes. His sort of ho oh, oh, mode, and then the mode that I can't even come close to imitating. And it, it made me think something while listening to this. Is Bon Iver, Justin Vernon, the voice of the century? <laughs> you know, like it's such a good voice and it's so dynamic and it's been heard so many places and it's influenced so many people. I think you could make a good argument. I mean, I know everyone's gonna say uh, Adele or Beyonce and th th those are probably better answers, you know, um, or, or The Weeknd for that matter. Maybe Ty Dolla Sign. My, my, I'm, I'm making a top five list here by mistake. Uh, but I do think there's a good argument you could say that Bon Iver is sort of the definitive voice of music for the last 15 years. Just a beautiful ending to this song. Next song is called Mimi with Ilse. Uh, I can't tell if this is about like the Trump coup or not. It's kind of a rocker, which is nice, kind of breaking things up. Like the, like the drums are kind of going and these guitars have the, like it sounds like things are going in rounds with the voices. It's quite nice. Easy to Sabotage is another out of nowhere song featuring Namim. And this has like this cool kind of bloopy keyboard in the back. Some like studio chatter that's kept in. And then, you know, Bon Iver has been famous for using, you know, auto tune and, and using it in a way that's artistic and interesting. And then uh, modern hip hop has been accused of using the auto tune in a boring way. Uh, but he's using it sort of in the modern like emo hip hop slash hyper pop style of auto tuner. So it's the like mixed in all together and it's great, you know, and singing all these lines, you can't hypnotize me. The drums are just so great. And the song even kind of ends up jamming out and just this weird sort of um, flying in the face a little bit of the sweater um, thesis that I'm working on here because it's intentionally sounding false. It's intentionally sounding like styrofoam, as opposed to like knit wool. Uh, I do wonder if we could potentially call this song cultural appropriation. I'm gonna say it. I'm just gonna say it for the engagement. <laughs> so, so now you can get mad at me. Anytime I say the word cultural appropriation, I get a lot of engagement. So agree or disagree with me violently in the comments, I don't care. Next song is called Hutch, and this album is too long. 
I don't like this song. It's fine. I don't know. I'm not going to talk about it. Don't make me talk about it. Don't make me talk about Hutch. I'm not going to do it. Next song, 8.22 AM, features La Force, uh, which is a great name. <laughs> Uh, and it's just, her voice is great. I think her voice, you know, there's a lot of voices I hadn't heard on the album. It's the nice one I'd never heard before. Uh, just beautiful guitar details all the way through. Magnolia is a great example of a song on this album that I initially thought was just kind of boring. Just kind of like, fill, you know, paint by numbers of this sound. But actually, uh, listening to it again, I realized it's just really sweet. It's just a really nice, great song. In particular, the guitar work and the drum work. Um, this album, because it sets such a consistent atmosphere, the sweater atmosphere, it can be easy to overlook the details. But much like, actually, much like a good knit pattern, you know, like when it's actually good, like look at that, that's insane. Some Someone in Ireland like put that all together. You know what I mean? And like when you actually listen to a song like Magnolia, you know, the lyrics maybe seem a little empty, like open-ended questions, not really saying anything. But really when you look up in detail, you actually get to it. I've got to, I've got to drop this sweater metaphor. I can tell you're getting tired of it. Uh, June is a River with Ben Howard, another person I don't particularly know, but he has a beautiful, smooth voice. Um, the music behind feels a little bit autopilot here for this project. I kind of like the, whenever the drum beats are automated, they're just not that good because I love the drumming when it's actually someone playing it. But again, little tiny details like the bass and the guitar coming in make it much nicer. Bracey is, it's a song about a sibling. That's, Apparently Aaron Destner's brother's name is Bryce and I think his sister co-wrote this. So I am all in favor of this. There need to be more songs about love that is not romantic and love that is not purely vertical. You know, I love you, mom. I love my son, all that stuff. You know, let's get some horizontal, non-sexual love songs. <laughs> I don't, that just sounds so, that sounds so whack. Yeah, I want more horizontal, non-sexual love songs, okay? Between friends, between coworkers, between brothers and sisters, between people who are equal and who don't depend on each other, but depend on each other because they love each other, okay? I love my brothers very much. I have three brothers. I think about them all the time, you know? I would love to have been able to create a work of art this nice. Like, you washed my back when I was young. Just beautiful. And I, I'm, I am completely for it, completely for this style of music, even if I just use the term horizontal, non-romantic love song. This is why I should have a script. I don't have a script, I have notes. And uh, I'll put this up here. You can pause it, you can see that horizontal, non-romantic love song is nowhere on my notes. Uh, the final song is called New Auburn, which returns with Anais Mitchell. And let me just say to Big Red Machine, it's pretty ballsy. <laughs> To have two songs with Taylor Swift and not have those be the songs that bracket the album. Have relatively, you know, much lesser known Anais Mitchell singing and she's the one in, who takes you in and takes you out of the album. A beautiful, the voice is much louder on this one though and it's just really nice and just a, a great song. I think it's maybe a very specific location in Minnesota. I think part of the sweater music is also being very tied into sweater friendly locations. You know, locations where you might have like an L being photo shoot, places like that. So there you go. So there you go. There's my review of Big Red Machine. I really enjoyed it. My wife, I think, really enjoyed it a lot too. I'm having a very schizophrenic day because I, I'm listening to, you know, I'm listening to this and I'm listening to, to the new uh, West Side Gun and then I'm listening to Kanye and I'm like this and Kanye and this and Kanye and just my brain's all mixed up. It's like a, it's like a collaboration going on there. All right, well, until next time, I'm gonna thank Toby for not barking. Uh, gonna say go socks. And there's the camera.